Do SATs and ACTs, are they accurate in predicting success in post-secondary education? Yes, is the short answer. The data that comes out of college records has revealed very clearly that students submitted SAT or ACT scores are very highly predictive of their academic performance when they get to college, much more so than guidance counselor recommendation letters or even their high school grades. In some sense, the fact that the test scores are more predictive of college academic performance than high school grades is not surprising given how much variation there is across high schools in grading standards and academic rigor. And of course, rampant grade inflation has made grades less meaning, meaningful. And so test scores are just very predictive and a really important signal that colleges have access to when they're looking for the right match, the right academic match between students and their level of academic rigor. What about the claims that I've seen that there's some cultural bias to these standardized tests? And by the way, they disadvantage students coming from less fortunate families. Yeah, there's a couple points to make here. First, researchers who have looked for this find that the test scores are very predictive of academic performance in college for students from different backgrounds. And so that counters the idea that it's not helpful for students from less advantaged backgrounds or it's biased against them. The second really important fact here is that college admissions officers don't consider standardized test scores in a vacuum. They're very open and, and transparent about the fact that they evaluate these in the context. The bar for what would be considered an impressive score is higher for students coming from more advantaged backgrounds than less advantaged backgrounds. And so that's really important to realize that admissions officers are contextualizing the scores when they're submitted. And by the way, this is why test, the move to test optional or test blind made it particularly difficult for kids from less advantaged backgrounds to signal to more academically rigorous schools that they were prepared. It's actually a particularly important signal for kids from less advantaged backgrounds to be able to deliver to university or college admissions officers who might not know their high school very well, for instance. Yeah, so there are various advantages people coming from families that, are, that have more wealth have, but one of them is this incredible industry that's grown up around preparing for the SAT and SAT, ACT. I'll just go to my personal experience. As you know, I'm involved in a charity in Yonkers helping the public school system. You go across the border to Bronxville, those kids are all getting tutoring, which costs a fair amount of money, not so much in Yonkers. Doesn't that skew the system? Yeah, but, but admissions officers are aware of that. So what they would see from a kid coming from Yonkers who likely doesn't have access to that kind of tutoring or, or preparation, really, they're not going to evaluate the scores the same. The report coming out of Dartmouth about why they're going back to requiring tests is very clear on this. So they use the example of a student from a, an advantaged background, a high-income family, a school that sends a lot of kids to selective schools, a 1,400 on the SAT would not have helped that student gain admission to Dartmouth. But for a student like your student from, from that you brought up from Yonkers, a 1,400 would have been very helpful to them in earning admission. The problem is when the schools went test optional, kids from different backgrounds were equally likely to withhold a school, a school score of 1,400, presumably for because kids from less advantaged backgrounds don't have access to the savvy college counselors who are more attuned to how the game is played and would have told them, no, this score is helpful for you. You're not being compared to the overall um, average or distribution. And so that's why the kids who were most harmed by the elimination of the test score requirement were really high achieving kids from less advantaged backgrounds. And that's a big part of the reason that schools like Dartmouth and Brown and MIT and Yale are saying they're going back to requiring these tests. Uh, certainly getting the right student into the right college is a starting point, but it's not the ending point. They also have to succeed once they get there. They have to make it all the way through. And the track record there that I've read about is not so great about a lot of uh, children making it all the way through, and particularly ones from less advantaged families. What can we do to make sure they succeed once they get there? I think this is really important. So, for instance, the University of California school system is still test blind, and people who are championing that have pointed out that those schools are now enrolling more students from underrepresented minority groups, less advantaged backgrounds. But the problem is if that access is coming at a cost of less academic match. And so you're bringing in students who are less likely to thrive, and you're undermining the match between the academic preparation of a student and the academic rigor of a particular campus. So getting the match right is critically important. We don't want to throw out signals of the match quality. And then students who are disadvantaged when they get to college 
you know, work has shown that a lot of students need a lot of support systems, and you want to be able to make sure that students are being well served by the campuses they're at. That's a different problem. And by the way, there's a related problem here, which is the fact that students from different backgrounds are much, you know, they have different levels of academic preparation by the time they're 18. That's not the fault of standardized test scores. That is a reflection of rampant inequality and class gaps and opportunities and schools and family background and all sorts of things that affect a student's likelihood of excelling in college when they're 18. And so, again, throwing out the metrics that show us these gaps exist don't mean the gaps don't exist. They just make us make it harder for us to identify them and know to where to put our efforts. We in the media cover this subject a great deal, I would say. We tend, I think, to focus on Ivy League schools. I'm saying as somebody who comes from University of Michigan, not an Ivy League school, maybe I'm a little bit uh, insecure about that. But it, give us a sense of how big a problem it is in the Ivy League schools as opposed to those state schools like I came from. I'm really glad you brought this up, and I'm proud to teach at one of these flagship state universities, University of Maryland. Um, but so let me be clear. The, all of the media emphasis and even our public leaders talk about what's happening in admissions at these private elite schools. The Ivy League, all eight schools combined, serve less than 1% of the 10.8 million students enrolled in four-year institutions in this country. So whatever these schools are doing in admissions, whether it comes to their testing regime or legacy admissions, is really not that material to the story of higher education in this country. I mean, it's very frustrating to me how much attention we give these schools, given that the flagship universities, the University of Michigan, University of Maryland, the SUNY system, the CUNY system, they serve so many more students than all of the Ivies put together. But here's another way to look at this. Over the past 30 years, our country has produced a million more college, four-year college degree holders than in 1990, okay? So we went from just over a million to just over two million. Do you know how many more degrees were granted by the Ivies? Combined, an additional 3,500. So when it comes to expanding access to higher education, the story is just not at the elite private schools. And so we need to be talking about what's happening at the state schools, the public schools, their lack of funding. That's where the real story is. And finally, Melissa, we just had a new budget proposed with the federal government. You spent a lot of time looking at that. I know you're concerned about the deficit and the debt that we're building up. At the same time, what did you see in that budget, if anything, that could help this problem of really making sure we're supporting kids coming from less fortunate families? What I would have liked to see in the budget is a much bigger allocation of funding towards spending on kids towards spending on less advantaged groups. I mean, we spend more on interest on the debt at this point than we do on all federal programs aimed at children. If we want to equip more students to be in a position to thrive in college, if we want to close class gaps to build up our workforce, we need to be shifting the budget, not just away from deficit spending and interest payments, but really to have a more dedicated focus on forward-looking investments. And that, that means in, in kids. Um, and younger generation in this country. That's what I would have liked to have seen in the budget. <laughs>